Okay, um, so next talk is going to be a variant president, Path. He's going to talk us to us about logic model theory. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's go. Okay, yeah, like somehow it doesn't support PDFs, so I'll have to do this. <laughs> but that has the added advantage that I can actually write on this, so it's good. Let's go. So the talk is on model theory and first order logic. It's titled Between Arbitrarily Large and Infinite. And this was basically my summer project, uh, the reading project with Dr. Gregory Wilson Act from the computer lab. So what, what is the title? The title is addressing a question, which is, if you have a formula phi, and if, if phi of n is true for arbitrarily large n, is the thing true for infinite? For example, if you have a formula, if there exists a set Sn of cardinality n, now, now this thing is true for arbitrarily large numbers n, right? Like you can have a set of cardinality 1,500 and 2,000 and whatever number you can dream of. Can you use this fact to somehow prove that there exists a set of size infinity? Then yes, you can just take the union over all natural numbers of the sets that you have generated using the sentence. And you see that phi of infinity is true because the first, it, it's because it's true for arbitrarily large n, it's also true for infinite. But, but when exactly can we do this? That, that's an important question, right? When exactly am I allowed to make this jump from arbitrarily large to infinite? And, and that's what the talk deals with. So, so there's a, a few things to discuss here. What do you mean by a formula? What do you mean by arbitrarily large? These are the two important things that the question is asking. And then the last thing is when can you make this jump? What is a formula? Uh, a, a set, so an example which does not work is this thing where you can sum up n, the sum of n rationals lies in the set of rationals. This is true for arbitrarily large n. Like the sum of 2000 rational numbers is still a rational number. But the sum of infinitely many rational numbers need not be a rational number. So this is an example of a sentence that you can't make the jump for. So when can you make this jump? So, so let's start about the, the first task is formalizing the idea of a formula, a sentence. If there are any questions, I'm trusting my committee members to raise the point. Yeah, there's not any right now. Yeah. So the, the first thing you want to formalize is the idea of a sentence, a logic, a language. Uh, for that, you need a set of words. Like even if we draw a direct comparison with natural languages, what you first need is a set of words in the form of a vocabulary which has symbols for constants, variables, and functions, relations, everything you need to talk about, you need to have a symbol for that first. If I want to talk about zero, I need to have a symbol for zero. If I want to talk about one, I need to have a symbol for one. Similarly, I need variables, x, y, okay, yeah. I need symbols for functions. And for every function, I also need an arity. That is, I need, a notion of this function takes this many inputs. A binary relation, the arity is two. A binary function, the arity is two. That kind of thing. So a vocabulary is basically this set. It gives you all the information you need to talk about things. Once you have a vocabulary, you need a logic. Where a, a logic, first of all, contains this set, S. It's a fancy S. I don't know why slash script does this. It looks like a G. But what you have is a set S that tells you how you can put together the symbols in your vocabulary. For example, something like, this thing does not make sense, right? It's, it's not a meaningful sentence, but this is a meaningful sentence. And, 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 and this information is contained in this set S. What you have after that, is, is this weird symbol, which is called a truth predicate. And it's a relation. What it does is it relates sentences and structures. Where a sentence is true in a structure, a sentence is related to a structure through this relation if the sentence is satisfied by the structure. We'll talk about what a structure is in, in a minute. 
So a logic and a vocabulary together give us a language, which are all the think tools we need to talk about our structure and the truth of sentences. Five plus three equals nine is a sentence, but that's not true if I can add correctly. It's not true. So the truth predicate tells you when things are true and when they're not in your structure. You can have an arbitrary universe in which five plus three equals nine, and that universe would be beautiful because I can't add. So an example of a logic would be infinitary logic. So for example, these are special classes of logics, L, Kappa, Lambda. And what the Kappa and Lambda tell us is, 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 is information that is contained in this set S. This time the information is, you can have up to Kappa quantifiers in a row, and up, sorry, up to Kappa formulae by conjunction. So you can do phi one and phi two, or phi three up to kappa times. And you can have up to lambda quantifiers in a row. And, and this information is contained in the set S. So this is a special class of logics called L, uh, infinitary languages, infinitary logics. And, and the other important thing is your quantifiers must span over the entire set. So I'll just erase all of this so that your quantifiers must span over the entire set. What this means is if I say there exists an X. I'm saying there exists in the entire set, there exists an element. If I'm saying for all X, I'm saying for every set in the end, for every X in the entire universe, for every element in the entire universe, something is true. Contrast this with something like the lowest upper bound property of natural numbers, where you say for every subset of R with the least upper bound, since you're doing for every subset, you're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to quantify over subsets. You're only allowed to quantify over elements. And that's, that's the information contained here. Your quantifiers must span over the entire set. That's what's allowed in infinitary logic. So the most important object, like the key object we'll be studying is L omega omega, where your kappa and lambda are the first infinite cardinal, the countable infinity, the cardinality of natural numbers. So let's put all of this into context. If I wanted to talk about group theory, I would probably need to distinguish one element as the identity, and I would need a binary operation. So my vocabulary would be limited to these two symbols where I can talk about an identity now, and I can talk about a binary operation. And, and, and these, so this would be the vocabulary alongside my usual variables, X, Y, Z, which allow me to quantify. And if I, and, and if I choose my logic to be L omega omega, then I have the first order language of groups. So using these, I can formulate the group axioms. For example, I can say there exists an inverse as for every X, there exists Y, X dot Y equals E. And that's the axiom that every element has an inverse in the group. Automatically, all my quantifiers are going over the entire set. The set this time is my group. Now, what's important to highlight so far are there questions? Yeah, pass. Um, does, when you say up to lambda quantifiers in a row, does that mean uh, up to lambda qu uh, expressions of the type quantify variable, quantify variable, and so on? Or, or does that mean you can just put lambda quantifiers in a row without any variables? Uh, it's, it includes statements of this form. Uh, yeah, basically, for every x there exists y, for every z okay. of, of this form, you can have up to lambda. So you, you can't okay, have yeah. uncountably many in L omega omega. You can have countably many, because the omega tells you you must have countably many of these. Yes. Is that fine? Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Thanks. So what you have so far is purely syntactic. All of these are symbols on paper, which have no meaning yet. What's important is you also want, you have this language because you want to talk about something, that something is a structure. So what you have next is a structure of, as, uh, of a vocabulary. So A is a sigma structure, sigma is a vocabulary. A is a sigma structure. If for every symbol in sigma, I have a corresponding thing in A. For every function symbol in sigma, I have a corresponding function defined on A. 
for every constant symbol in sigma i have a constant element defined in a and so on and 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 like this function which takes the symbol to its element is called interpretation for example if my set a was 1 2 3 4 5 i can interpret dot as addition modulo 5 and e as 5 and then if i write any sentence in group in the in the language of groups i can interpret it in the context of a if i can write e plus e equals e this is this was first just scribbles on paper but now with this interpretation i can interpret this as so this should have been a dot 5 plus 5 equals 5 and now i can talk about this in a in in a semantic sense so far these were syntactic scribbles now i have a syntax semantic meaning to them now i have given a semantic meaning to them and so you can see already that a will not satisfy the group axioms so we write a is not related to the theory of groups because the theory of groups is not true in a is that fine we have addressed the first question first part of the question which was if you have what, what is a formula we we have formalized the idea of a language a logic now what do you mean by arbitrarily large so so let's try to when i say something is large i would mean to say it contains mostly everything so so this is the key phrase here mostly everything if something is large it contains mostly everything in the universe so for a set v i'll try to create a set of subsets so uh, the example you should have at the back of your mind is the definition of a topology even if you don't know that it's fine but if you have done meta top or analysis 2 then you should have you should be thinking about a topology right now for a set v i define a set of subsets of v such that the subsets are sub, the subsets are large the sub, subsets contain mostly everything so the first obvious thing that comes to my mind is the empty set does not contain mostly everything that's very obvious so the empty set is not a part of u which is a set of large subsets a second thing that seems plausible is a if a contains mostly everything and a is contained in b then b contains mostly everything and that's a fair definition to have if a contains mostly everything and b contains mostly everything then if this is your v if this is a and this is b and if a and b both contain mostly everything then you would expect the intersection to contain mostly everything and, and so let's just add that to our definition of u again and lastly if a contains mostly everything then the complement of a cannot contain mostly everything just these are just based on words but what we have created here using these four rules is a proper set of subsets of v something similar to a topology not exactly because the axioms are different but when i when i say you should have topology at the back of your mind that that's something similar we have created here we have created a set of subsets of v if you exclude the last one you have a filter but if you include the last one you have you have what is called an ultra filter these are just notions these are just words but they capture this idea of containing mostly everything really well and a, a very good example of why this is useful is if you have a set of voters so so here's where the symbolism plays i i chose v for a very particular reason because if you if you let v be the symbol of if v is a set of voters then i can create a very good election system using the, the notion of an ultra filter where i can say a candidate a wins if and only if the set of voters who voted for him is a part of the ultra filter that is the set the subset of voters who voted for him or her contain mostly every mostly everything in the set of voters that is if a large subset of the voters voted for someone that person must be elected and and, and this has good applications in election theory so this is, so we have described what is uh, we have described an ultra filter 
that is a set of subsets that contain mostly everything in a set. Let's, let's call an ultrafilter principle if it is of this form. That is, if it is generated by one element, then let's call it principle. So what we had was, if, a, if you remember the axioms, if A is in the ultrafilter, then every other, every set containing A is in the ultrafilter. So, so in the context of principal ultrafilters, it would be if an element A, so if this is a set V, and this is a particular element that generates the non that generates the principal ultrafilter, then my, my ultrafilter would be entirely based on all the sets that contain this particular person. And this is sort of like a dictatorship where we are saying a set is automatically large if the dictator is in the set. Now, now this is a key theorem that you can prove and the proof is fairly straightforward. It's just elementary counting arguments and Venn diagrams. You can say, show that every ultrafilter on a finite set must be principal. That is, in voting theory terms, sorry, in voting theory terms, it translates exactly to Arrow's theorem, which is for more than three candidates, you cannot have all three. You cannot have consensus, independence of irrelevant alternatives, and non-dictatorship. Because the first two, because the first two things are what define a, an ultrafilter on the set of voters, but then using the theorem, we know that the, the ultrafilter must be principal, that is, you have a dictatorship. Are there any questions? I assume not. So I'll just explain these terms once. Consensus is just if if an ultrafilter, if a set in the ultrafilter wants someone to win, that person must win. And the second thing means if A greater than B, then this result must not affect whatever is happening between C and D. The ordering must not be changed. So that's independent because what's happening between A and B is irrelevant to the or relative ordering of C and D. And, and, and these two rules together are what define, if, if you translate these two rules to the set of voters, you would get an ultrafilter. That's a really cool result. And, and this was actually, initially this was talked about by Terence Tao in one of his blog posts. It, it's a pretty cool result. So let's, let's take this voting thing, let's push this, a bit more, a bit further. We had structures. And there are a few classical ways to create more structures from existing ones. Again, you should be having groups at the back of your mind. You can have subgroups. You can have supergroups or whatever you call them. And similarly, you have substructures and superstructures, which are just structures within structures, which are still consistent models of the thing. A second good way we have to create new structures from existing ones is the notion of direct products, Cartesian products. And I'm, I'm assuming people know what Cartesian products are, which are just the Cartesian product of A cross B is just the set of all elements such that A is in A and B is in B. And, and that's a and this itself, what you can do is if A and B are structures, you can equip this with an interpretation function. For example, if A and B are groups, and if E A is the identity in group A, and if E B is the identity in group B, I can interpret this ordered pair. I can interpret this ordered pair to be the identity in A cross B. And so direct products are a very reliable way of creating new groups from old. Another reliable way is once you have these direct products, you can play around with them. And instead of saying, so sorry. So what we have here is in a direct product, the addition and all would be defined point wise, right? And that seems like a really strict, that seems like a really strict condition. If you have a lot of things, 
if you have just A1 cross A2 cross, if you have this infinite product, in this product, defining things pointwise would be a really strict condition. Like, what we can do instead is we can have these individual elements voting on what the identity element should be or what the result of a function should be. So what you're sort of doing is you're taking this thing and you're taking a, you're taking a modulo some relation. That, that relation is voting. And, and what you have created here is an ultra product. So for a set of sigma structures, AI, uh, how do I create clear everything on the screen? If there are any questions, just feel free to ask. No questions as of yet. No questions as of yet. Thank. This either means that nothing is understandable or everything is. I'm assuming the latter. So anyways, that's good enough for now. What, what we do is, for a set of sigma structures AI indexed over a set I, we define their direct product to be just this thing. Given an ultra filter on I, we define a relation on the product such that two things are related if the set of elements over which they agree is a part of the ultra filter. Which means if, if two of the, if two elements in this direct product agree mostly everywhere, then they correspond to the same element in the ultra product. And, and this is an equivalence relation and the set of equivalence classes forms the ultra product. So the, the definition is pretty technical and you can work through why this is an equivalence relation and why certain things hold and why this is a structure to begin with. But just take my word for it, it exists. And the, the thing you should have at the back of your mind is these structures are coming together and voting. You can, you can imagine a mini democracy happening here. And, and, and these structures are doing this. And there's this really cool theorem by Wash. This is pronounced Wash. I don't ask me why. But for the first order logic L omega omega and vocabulary sigma, if you have a collection of sigma structures and an ultra filter, then the truth predicate obeys this voting. This, the truth predicate respects voting. That is something is true in the ultra product if and only if it is true in most of the structures. And, and this is a really powerful tool. This, this leads to really interesting results. One of which is the compactness here, which brings, back, brings us back to the original question of when can you jump between arbitrary large and infinite? This is the dramatic reveal, this, the compactness theorem, which says for first order logic and vocabulary sigma, what you have is a, a theory is a set of sentences. Which can be potentially infinite. And, and the compactness theorem is saying that there is an ultra filter such that this direct product, the compactness theorem is saying that if every finite subset is satisfied, then the whole thing is satisfied. That, that is the crust of this uh, compactness theorem. So if every single finite subset you can think of is satisfied by a structure, is satisfied by some structure in the universe, if for every finite subset there exists a structure, then what you can do is take the direct product of all of them and the direct product will satisfy the entire theory. So what we have done here is we have equated finite satisfiability with satisfiability as a whole. Uh, I'll, I'll try to explain this better. But, but that, that's the thing. So the arbitrarily large thing is create, contained in here. If every finite subset, it can be arbitrarily large. If every single finite subset has a model, then the entire infinite theory has a model. 
and, and that's the compactness theorem. And all the ultra products give us a constructive way to construct the model for this one. Ultra products give a constructive way by just taking the ultra products of the individual models here. So there, there's a nicer non-constructive proof, which I will try to recreate here. What you have is Godel's completeness theorem, which just says a theory is satisfiable if and only if it is consistent. And this is a, a, an important theorem because it's saying whatever you write, if you can prove it, by consistency, I mean I can prove it. If I can prove it, then it has a model in real life. That is, you can find a structure in which it is true. And these two things need not be true. What this contains, is a reason our proof system is good. That is, I can prove true statements. If statements are semantically true, I should be able to prove them on paper because proofs otherwise are just scribbles on a sheet of paper, symbols in a row. And again, this brings us back to the original theme of connecting syntactic and semantic notions. Compactness, completeness theorem does exactly that. And this was a breakthrough in 19th or 20th century logic. So th this is more important than Godel's incompleteness theorem in my opinion. And this allows us to write a nice proof of compactness theorem. So I'll try to. So, so let's look at an example of compactness theorem first. Uh, so let, the, the statement we have here is finiteness. And am I able to talk about finiteness using a logic that supports compactness? If a logic supports compactness, can I quantify the idea of a set is finite? So, so let's do that. Let's suppose there were sigma, which were a set of axioms of finite sets. That is, a set is finite if and only if it satisfies sigma. Let's add more sentences to sigma. We'll add the sentence T1 to sigma, which says there exists one element. We'll add the sentence T2 to sigma, which says there exists two unique elements, at least two elements. And, and, and so Tn says there exist at least n elements. And it's, it's not hard to see that any finite subset is satisfiable because any finite subset would contain a greatest n. So you can just take a finite set with n elements. It will satisfy sigma because it's finite and it will satisfy everything up to Tn because there are at least n unique elements. But since every finite set is satisfiable, this whole thing is satisfiable. That is, you have a finite set which contains at least infinite elements. And that's a contradiction. So what we have shown is, in fact, our assumption was wrong and sigma cannot exist. Thus, using compactness, you can show that you can never have a first order axiomatization of finiteness. In other words, first order logic is blind to the idea of finiteness. It can't distinguish between arbitrarily large and infinite. And that's exactly when you can make the jump. You can make the jump if your logic cannot say this is finite and this is infinite. Then it will just say if something is true for large numbers, it is true for infinity. So, so this, I, I look at a more direct proof of compactness theorem since we have time. And the more direct proof goes something like, we want to prove finite satisfiability if and only if entirely satisfiable. But if we look back at the completeness theorem, it's saying satisfiability is the same as consistency. That is, you can prove every true statement and prove no false statement. So we can, let's use this. So, so satisfiability then translates to consistency. And similarly here, you can replace it with consistency. So one way it is a straightforward proof, if the, infinity to, if the infinitude of sentences is consistent, then every finite subset must be consistent. If you cannot prove a false statement using the entire thing, then you cannot prove a false statement using any finite subset, right? What about the other way? Let's assume, we will go by contradiction here, which leads to the non-constructive proof. Let's assume the whole thing is finitely consistent, but infinitely inconsistent. That is every finite subset is consistent, but the whole thing together provides a proof of phi and not phi. 
So this is an infinite theory. This theory proves a single dash means proves. So this theory proves phi and not phi, since the entire theory is inconsistent. If you can write a proof of phi and not phi, that is, you have a set of sentences. You have a set of sentences, uh, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3. This is a conventional proof like you would do in a math class. And the last say, sentence would be phi and not phi. And, and all the implications are logical. Theta 1 implies theta 2 implies theta 3 and so on. Now, proofs by definition are finite in nature. You cannot have infinitely long proofs. But since this proof is finite, it must be using only finitely many starting points from sigma. So what I have now is a finite subset of sigma that is proving phi and not phi. And that's contradicting my assumption because I was assuming sigma is finitely consistent. Hence, I have proven the compactness theorem by contradiction. Finite consistency must imply entirely consistent. Are there any questions? I'm sorry if this is going too fast or too slow, whichever. Are there any questions? Uh, not so much chat. How many people are attending, just out of curiosity? Uh, we've got uh, around... It's 38 attendees right now. Oh, that's, that's like usual talks. That's nice. Yeah, that's so, decent. Yeah, hopefully the question. proof How made sense. Dan? Uh, Dan, yeah, Dan has a quick question. Oh yeah, yes, Dan. I assume he's typing currently, so yeah. Okay. Yeah, Dan won't speak. Well, it's fine. Oh, I'm able to speak. You hear that? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, I hear that. Okay. Oh, wow. Hello. Uh, yeah. So if you're not consistent, is that equivalent to being able to prove phi and not phi for something, or is that just an example of a way in which you can be inconsistent? No, consistency is defined to be you cannot prove a false statement. So if something is not consistent, you must be able to prove a false statement. Okay. And every false statement can be written as phi and not phi. Like this right. is a generic false statement. Cheers. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. So let's move on. I'll address questions at the end as well. The other important theorem which I'll just mention in passing is the Lowenheim's column theorem, which says for a first order language and a countable vocabulary, if you have a model of size kappa for some infinite cardinal kappa, then you have a model of size lambda for every infinite cardinal lambda. In other words, the first order language cannot distinguish between different sizes of infinity. So first order logic, did not really attend numbers and sets because they don't know there are different sizes of car infinity. Sorry for the bad joke. Let's move on. Why is first order logic important? This brings us back to the question, when can I make the jump from arbitrarily large to infinite? When is my logic blind to different sizes of infinity? And for first order logic, yes, I know. If my sentence is in first order, I know that it cannot distinguish between countably in, between finite and infinite and different sizes of infinity. But something much stronger was proven by Lindstrom. And the strength of first order logic. So let's first define when a logic is stronger than something else. We say a logic L is stronger or more ac expressive than another logic L prime. If every class of structures that you can axiomatize in L prime, you can axiomatize in L or it's just this idea of expressivity. If I can axiomatize groups in L prime, I should be able to axiomatize it in L as well, if L is stronger, because L is more expressive. So it should be, and, and we say two things are equivalent if each is more expressive than the other. This is just standard definition. The theorem by Lindstrom says, if any logic is stronger than the first order logic, it cannot have compactness and downward Lowenheim's column property. In other words, L omega omega is the strongest logic that supports this jump. In other words, if you have a logic stronger than this, you must, you have to distinguish between different classes of infinity and you have to distinguish between arbitrarily large and infinite. So the example that we looked at, sum of infinite rationals is irrational. That sentence, 
must be written in second order logic or higher. It cannot be written in first order logic. What do I mean by second order logic? Second order logic lets us quantify over subsets. So the classic example is the least upper bound property, which if you were to quantify, you would say for every non-empty subset with an upper bound. If there is like it every non-empty subset with an upper bound must have an upper bound. And the upper and it must also have a least upper bound. And, and this thing inherently is written in second order logic because of this thing, because you're quantifying over subsets. The fact that real numbers are unique up to isomorphism supports Lindestrom's classification of logic. Why? Because if the real numbers were axiomatized in first order logic, then you would have to support Lowenhaus Coulomb theorem, which says you can have isomorphic models of all cardinalities. But we know that the real numbers are unique up to isomorphism, that is Dedekind cuts and Cauchy sequences all correspond to the same structure. And this thing is supported, this thing supports our assertion that first order logic is the strongest thing that supports isomorphic things of different cardinalities. This begs for the question, what about the first order properties of the real numbers? We have enough time, so let's talk about this. So, so this is, let, let's talk about a first order property of the real numbers. I'll write this sentence. There exists X, X less than one over one plus one plus plus one, I times, and, and this is TI. And as you can see, every finite subset of TI is satisfiable. You can, you can, for any finite subset, there must be a largest TN. So if you just choose one over N plus one, it's a real number that is smaller than one over N. Since every finite subset is satisfiable and this sentence, this theory is entirely written in first order logic, it must have a structure. So it must have a structure. Let's call that structure R star. It is a structure that satisfies the theory of real numbers, the first order theory of real numbers, along with the sentence, there is a number smaller than everything. Like there, there is a, an element epsilon that is bigger than zero, but smaller than every rational, every real number in modulus. Similarly, you, you have to have a notion of infinity if you just remove this one over, you can have the sentence there exists x, x greater than one plus one plus one plus. So just out of interest, I'm writing one plus one plus one instead of n itself, because we don't have a symbol for every real number. What we have is a symbol for one and a symbol for addition in the vocabulary. But since this sentence is, has a model, the model of real numbers for every n, it must also have an infinite model because it's first order. And that infinite model is R star. How do you define R star? This was Abraham Robinson's paper on the non-standard reals, also called hyperreals. And he used this because in ancient times, calculus was done in terms of these infinitesimal quantities and it led to a bunch of problems. You cannot have something that's smaller than every real, but bigger than zero and you can't do calculus with it properly. You can't have infinitesimal changes. Abraham Robinson said you can, given you're willing to let go of second order properties of the real numbers. And the definition is pretty straightforward. For we define the real numbers as Cauchy sequences. That is, we took sequences of rationals, we took sequences of rationals, q to the n implies sequences of rationals, and we quotiented it out by a certain relation. And that was Cauchy's definition of the real numbers. Similarly, we'll define R star to be sequences of reals quotiented out by an ultra filter. So we have an ultra product, infinite ultra product, where every single element is R. Any questions so far? Uh, 
Radanshu, any questions? Sorry, I forgot my mic was muted. Uh, no, no questions so far. No questions so far, very good. So, so the definition is, so for example, now let, let's look at this definition a bit more. Clearly, R is a subset of R star because for any R, for any real number, we have the element R, 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 this infinite sequence of R's quotiented out by an ultra filter. Now, obviously, these agree mostly everywhere because they agree literally everywhere, right? And, and so the equivalence class of this thing, we can equate with the real number R. And so for every real number, we have a corresponding element in R star. So R is a subset of R star. Is that fine? We can show that this inclusion is proper because look at the sequence one, half, a third, a fourth, and so on. The equivalence class of this sequence must differ with every real number in infinitely many places, just by definition. You cannot have a real number which coincides with this mostly everywhere, right? So you have elements in R star that are not in R. A, a second example would be one, two, three, four, and so on. The equivalence class of this, the equivalence class of this, these cannot correspond to any real numbers. So we have shown that R star is in fact bigger than R. Uh, bigger in the sense that it's it's not a prop, it's it's not equal to R. We call elements of this type. This is smaller than every real number. So, uh, using Walsh's theorem and the transfer of the transfer principle, which basically says you can use the ultra you can use the ultra product to generalize functions. If if a hyperreal A, a hyperreal A is less than hyperreal B, if it's less than B mostly everywhere, if its sequence is less than the sequence for B mostly everywhere, right? And so we can see that this is smaller than every real number in modulus. And similarly, this is bigger than every real number in modulus. So what we have here is an idea of an infinitesimal and an idea of an infinity. And, and, and these are real, these are hyper real numbers. They're not real numbers, but they're hyper real numbers, which you can use to talk about calculus. So for example, we have an idea of, uh, so, so let's first talk about the idea of closeness. Uh, well, here's a question um, from VB. The hyper reals are only partially ordered, right? Is that correct? Um, what would it mean for them to be totally ordered? Let me think. Yeah, they're, they're only partially ordered. Yeah, you can't really compare. Yeah, I mean, I think just as an example. Okay, actually, based on the yeah. definition of based on what your ultra filter is, I think you can have a total order on it. What was the example? Um, so with the uh, inequality you gave that A is less than B if it's less almost everywhere, yeah. then you can just have a sequence which alternates between 0 and 1, right? And you can't com Wait, no. Yeah, so if you have a sequence which alternates between 0 and 1 and starts with a 0, and another one which alternates but starts with a 1, then neither is greater than zero one. Yes. So, okay. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I, uh, that's something I should have highlighted a bit more. Your ultra filter, the idea of mostly everywhere is not based on the idea of, based on your idea of mostly everywhere, is based on what the ultra filter says the bigger set is. And, and we said uh, an important thing with an ultra filter was every subset must either be in the ultra filter or be outside it. Because A is in the ultra filter if and only if its complement is outside it. So the ultra filter must say that either the odd positions or the even positions, one of the two sets is bigger. 
the ultra filter given a particular subset the ultra filter must say if it is most if it is or if it is large or not it cannot say two subsets are of equal size okay yeah that makes that sense fine? so you have a total you have a total order thank you so is there anything else oh, no nothing else so far nothing else so uh, we have this idea of closeness where a hyperreal r is close to another hyperreal r prime if r prime is r plus some infinitesimal that is if r prime is only infinitesimally different from r and and this is an equivalence relation so you can talk about when two things are close and when two things are far so in fact what this does is for every hyperreal it defines a sort of halo around it that is this is the this is a set of all elements that are close to this hyperreal and it is possible to prove that exactly one real number is close to it given one hyperreal it has exactly one real number close to it so in some sense you have the set of reals and their halos and and that's the set of hyperreals along with infinities here and infinities here that's another way to look at the hyperreals uh, and this gives us these... yes um are these halos do they give a topology on the hyperreals they give a topology oh i haven't thought about this it's a really good question just because you say it's a notion of closeness which is yes somewhat... indeed i think it should be able to it it can it can definitely be a basis for a topology right like yeah the union of two halos is not a halo because that would contain two different two different real numbers but you can use these as a basis yeah, for a topology yeah. and and that would be that would be it yeah Yeah. And, and and yeah, thank you. So once we have this notion of closeness, we can do classical calculus that is limits and continuity without the epsilons and deltas, which is a really good thing. And it brings us back to the good old days of when I did not have to deal with analysis and approximations. How? Let's see. So if I have a sequence of reals if i have a sequence of reals i define the limit of this sequence as i just take the sequence and i quotient by the ultra filter and this gives me a hyperreal right this hyperreal is exactly what i would define to be the limit of the sequence so so you have simplified the idea of and, and what and, and the way terry tau describes this he says you can imagine every single position is voting on what the limit should be so this position is saying the limit should be 1 this position is saying the limit should be 1 this position is saying the limit should be 1.2 this position is saying the limit should be 1.23 and so on and based on the voting the ultra filter finds out the result of the voting and that's the limit and that's a very natural definition of limits which it also takes out the entire question of divergence because if a sequence is divergent then the limit is an infinite uh, as an infinite quantity uh, and so on right uh so a good way to talk about continuity here would just be two things are close a function is continuous let's talk about this yeah so we define oh god uh, f is continuous if a close to b if and only if the f of a is close to f of b can you already see why this is a much nicer definition than for every epsilon there exists a delta such that a minus mod of a minus b less than epsilon implies mod of f of a minus mod of f of b less than delta i messed something around but it's a much nicer definition two things are close if their images are close 
And, and let's use this to prove, let's say x squared is continuous. Why is x squared continuous? If, if y is close to x, then y is x plus epsilon, right? So y squared is, and then you use Taylor's theorem, which, yeah. And then you just use Taylor's theorem, x squared plus two x epsilon plus epsilon squared. And, and this thing is too small. So this thing is still an infinitesimal. And this thing is still an infinitesimal. So this thing is still an infinitesimal. And y squared differs from x squared by an infinitesimal. So y squared is close to x squared. So x squared is a continuous function. And it, you can prove that this is exactly the epsilon delta definition and things that are continuous here remain to be continuous there. What you have to do is uh, translate the notion of a function using the ultra filter, but that's very straightforward. So a but, question from Janice asks, would it mean that the hyperreals are compact? Would it mean that the hyperreals are compact? I don't see why. You can have an open cover with no. Yeah, like even if you look at the set of all bases, uh, the set of all halos, firstly, it depends on the topology. So I'm assuming you're talking about the topology defined by the halos. The halos themselves form an open cover, but there's no finite subcover. Is that, does that make sense? Um, I'm waiting for a reply. <laughs> he means that sequentially compact. Is it sequentially? sequentially. Oh, oh, ah. I'd assume so, yes, because the ultra filter defines uh, the ultra filter. The ultra filter defines the limit directly. So yes, it is sequentially compact. Have I led to a contradiction here? I'm not sure. I'll, I'll think about this. Thank you. Uh, lastly, we'll just talk about a second order property that's clearly not true here, which is to describe how second order properties don't translate. The least upper bound property is not true because uh, the infinitesimals mess around with the least upper bound. And you can show that if something is in the set, then you can always increase it by an infinitesimal and it, you will never have a least upper bound. And, and that's about it. Thank you very much. I would like to, I gave this talk once at the Summer Research Festival, so this for that. But I would like to thank the committee for organizing this wonderful thing. We are having talks in the holidays and we are having talks in Easter and that's great because I miss maths. And yeah, thank you. Are there any questions, any comments, any feedback? I'm here to listen. Yeah, let's just thank Paul for the talk. It was really interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks.